Recording has begun. The clock has struck one. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah McAnulty. I run the Skype a Scientist program. This is our first Skype a Scientist live session for the fall semester of 2022. I'm so glad that you're all here with us. Welcome. We are going to be talking today with Peter Coffey, who is uh, an agriculture scientist and entomologist, which is to say like a bug scientist, among other things. And so today we're going to be talking about like how we learn what the best way to grow food is, um, among other things. Um, so here's like the ground rules, how this all works today. We're going to be talking for about 45 minutes, starting about now. Peter's going to introduce who he is, what he does, why he likes it. Um, and during that time, you can feel absolutely free to ask questions because these sessions are all about your curiosity. Um, for folks who joined us last semester, you might notice we don't have an ASL interpreter today because all of our ASL interpreters uh, from last semester got full-time jobs, which is great for them. Uh, but we're just using transcripts today. We hope to have ASL interpretation at all subsequent sessions, but we don't have it today. There's another one Monday that we might not have it for, um, but we've got the live transcript going so that you can still access what we're talking about. Um, I'm gonna leave it there uh, for now and hand it over to Peter. Thank you so much for joining us today, Peter. I'm super excited to be here. So yeah, so like Sarah said, um, please ask questions. Um, Normally, when I give talks in person, I'm I, I'm one of those people who's like interrupt me anytime. So yeah, so Sarah will interrupt me anytime. Um, so uh, as Sarah said, my name is Peter Coffey. I am a lab manager uh, at North Carolina A and T University. So this is uh, North Carolina's 1890 land grant university. So our historically black college university um, for for North Carolina, the state of North Carolina. It's the second or third largest in the country. And I work at the uh, research farm here at A&T, uh, which is the largest research farm at any 1890 university in the country, uh, acreage wise. Um, and I work for the horticulture unit. So um, the, my direct boss is a state specialist in horticulture for horticultural science. Um, and so he spends his days like writing grants uh, to get money to do research to help small farmers or disadvantaged farmers in North Carolina. And then I spend my days doing whatever he promised to do in those grants. So, um, so that's, that's kind of what I do. Um, I like it because it means that in reality, what I get to do is I get to farm um, and I get to do it in a fun sciencey way and I get to learn things while I'm farming. So I get to be outside almost every day um, I get to get absolutely filthy almost every day. Uh, I get to sweat. I get to freeze in the winter. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I like doing. Great. So um, everybody at home, Peter is literally like in the middle of nowhere on a farm right now. So um, in the past when we've done these with Peter, sometimes he cuts out and comes back. So um, the reason we're doing it in the field is because we wanted to show you like what do these experiments actually look like? What does it look like? So he does like a bunch of um, different uh, treatments basically with his plants to see um, what should he recommend to farmers to make them grow better. There's a lot of variables when we come, when it comes to growing food that we don't maybe think about if we like live in a city like me, I live in Philadelphia and we're growing, we're just like going to the grocery store, we're picking up a tomato and going about our day. Like we don't think about the little changes that you can do to make that tomato grow better. And so um, I recently had a session with Peter, so thankfully I, I know what he may or may not talk about today, so I can fill you in while he's like having internet issues. Um, but it's so cool what he's going to show us that I think it's worth the internet issue. Hi, Peter. Welcome back. <laughs> hi. Hi. Uh, so yeah, I'm back. Uh, I don't know when I got cut off. Uh, I was talking about my job. I like yeah, it. Yeah, you were talking about your job. job. If you... Maybe let's just like do the part where you show us what uh, the areas look like now so that we can okay. uh, just get into questions. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. All right. So um, I'm out here at our organic certified ground. Uh, so we have organic and non-organic ground at the horticulture unit. Um, and these are two of our most recently built high tunnels. So a high tunnel for people who are unfamiliar is kind of like a greenhouse. So I imagine most people are familiar with a greenhouse. A greenhouse has heating and cooling in it. So there's a variety of different ways that you can heat and cool a greenhouse. A high tunnel does not have those things. So um, a, uh, a, a finished high tunnel looks like 
this. So it's a passively heated building. It's all it is is a metal structure covered in clear plastic. And so we can seal it up and then the sun hits that clear plastic, heats up the air inside of it. It's trapped in there and we get a nice warm bubble of air. Uh, that allows us to grow things that want warm weather when it's cool out and things that want cool weather when it's cold out. So we get to extend our growing seasons into the fall and into the winter and sometimes through the winter. So we grow a lot of our vegetables inside high tunnels. They're really, really common for uh, growing uh, high value crops, uh, especially for small farms where you may not have a lot of land, but you want to grow as much as you possibly can on a small amount of land. You get um, basically inside structures like this, you're turning all of your, your difficulty and your production up to 11. You, you're making farming more complicated, but for possibly a bigger payoff if you do it correctly. That's kind of the whole big rub. So in here, in this tunnel right here, we're wrapping up a tomato experiment. So you can see these tomato plants. This is what we've been growing all summer. They are massive They're and huge. overgrown. And we're actually pulling these out uh, next week. Um, we're done with them for the year. Um, and so a lot of what we do is just farm on this research farm. Uh, so we wanna know which of two different techniques work better. We try both of those techniques and we compare the results and see which one paid off more. Or if we wanna know which kind of uh, crop or which variety of crop does better, we grow both of those crops and we compare them to see which one does better. So that's a lot of the kind of basic outlines of the research that we do here on the research farm. Um, here you can see half of one of our research tunnels so, uh, is still producing eggplant and peppers. And in the back there, uh, some of our loofah plants. So the basic way that we set these experiments up is we do them in small plots and then we replicate those plots. So one of the really important things to do when you're doing research is replication so that you know that things are, you know, that any differences you're seeing are due to the factors that you're studying and not some other kind of factor. So for these pepper plants, we're growing two varieties of pepper. So this front one right here, Sweet Sunrise, it's that yellow one that you'll see. I don't know if you can see yellow peppers. And then over here, we've got our Olympus, which are the red ones. And then we keep going. We've got these yellow ones. So it's the yellow ones again. And then here, we've got the red ones again. And then red, and then yellow again. So we're growing them in small plots and we're replicating those plots so that we can know that you know, if, if we only planted the sunrise down at that end and not at this end, and we had different soil down at that end or different sunlight or the water was better down there, maybe, you know, differences in production that we were seeing would be due to that and not, not the variety. That's what we're actually testing. So okay. for an example, I'll show you these eggplant over here. This variety, Traviata right here is about chest high on me. Looks like we're gonna, we're about to go through a Peter loss and regain cycle here. Um, so I don't know if you all have seen loofahs before. I learned this when I was like maybe 30 years old. Uh, Loofa are those like things that you use in the shower. You may, they look kind of like, um, like a sea sponge kind of. Um, I have admittedly never, I've only ever used like the plastic ones you get at the dollar store, but there are also like real uh, wildlife looking things that you can use to scrub uh, dead skin off your body. I thought that they came from the ocean. I'm a marine biologist. Maybe I think everything comes from the ocean, but turns out it's a plant and they're so strange looking. They grow on vines and Peter's growing them in, I think this room, if not one of the other rooms he shows us. Um, they are like, they look like huge zucchinis. And when they're fully grown, um, you can like peel them and dry them. And then you chop them up into like usable shower loofahs. I'm talking about how loofahs are plants that you're growing oh, yeah. and how that I just can't believe that that is the way the world works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we grow an awful lot of loofahs uh, this summer. Yeah, we were growing them specifically, like you were saying, for edible loofahs. But at the end of the season, all the ones that we like couldn't bother to harvest. We've got those, uh, we're saving those for seed so that we can give away seeds to farmers who are interested in growing them. So Peter's walking back to his office now so that this stops happening. Um, 
that's what's going to happen after this. But uh, the questions coming in so far are great. Um, you don't need to keep greeting us in the in the comments. We want those to be mostly um, questions for Peter. Um, but we've got six great questions in here so far, now eight. Um, so we will ask these questions of Peter uh, too when he gets back. Um, how many years has Peter been working there? I think the answer is two, but we'll get back to that. Um, interesting question from Charlene. How does organic compare to inorganic growth? Um, I, I will find out. I, I don't know the answer, but um, Peter will help us with that. Um, here he comes. Sarah, I don't know what it is, but I swear you're the only person I have this, these disconnect problems with. Really? Yeah. Huh. I'm cursed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, lupas are one of those things that we grew this summer um, as uh, were, they were edible. We were intending uh, for them to be edible, but we uh, saved a lot to produce seeds so we could give seeds away to farmers. And um, uh, so we were able to keep a bunch of sponge lupas. Um, just for bundies too. So I have plenty of loofahs at home. I'm sure. Great. Your skin is extremely exfoliated. Um, oh gosh, not again. Well, he's driving back to the office where there's good Wi-Fi, so this won't happen. Um, so questions we have so far that I'll be asking. Peter, what do you do in the research farm? We kind of answered that. We uh, compare um, different techniques. It could be as as simple as like, how much water do you put on the plant? Or like, what covering do you put on the soil? There was a whole experiment where Peter was comparing um, like black soil cover. This is a way um, to help keep water like in the roots. So like, you'll sometimes see, it looks like black trash bags go over the soil and then the plant comes through that black plastic. Um, he had like, green plastic, blue plastic, clear plastic, white plastic, black plastic, and wanted to see which one worked better. I think it was soybeans he was working with. It was one, one of a crop that you eat. Um, so those are the kinds of questions he asks. He works with a ton of different plants, not just tomatoes or just loofahs, um, all different kinds of stuff, uh, all asking questions all at the same time. Um, a question from Matthew here from uh, Natalie's science class in Rochester, Minnesota. What have you discovered about bugs eating plants? Did oh, you hear that, Peter? Yes, I did. Great. Yes. I'll try and answer before I get disconnected again. I'm on my way back to my office. So hopefully I'll have a more stable connection when I get back there. Great. Um, what have I discovered about bugs eating plants? Well, bugs love to eat plants. So a big part of our focus is how to keep them from eating plants. And The last time we did this, it wasn't as bad. We only got disconnected like three times, not like five times. But uh, Peter is, in his previous life, was an entomologist. So he studied bugs. Um, and also on his Instagram, um, which I can link in the chat, uh, he takes really zoomed in pictures of bugs. So you can see like how beautiful bugs are. Um, you might think of bugs as being yucky. Like in the city, a lot of times, the only bugs that I see are like cockroaches a lot of the time, at least in, where I live in Philadelphia. Um, but a lot of the bugs that he takes pictures of are like brightly colored and beautiful beetles. And um, so he uses what's called macro photography to take pictures so we all can appreciate the bugs that he sees. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do to prevent uh, bugs from eating uh, plants while you're growing them. One of those, of course, is pesticides. You can put chemicals on that prevent the bugs from wanting to eat them. But sometimes you can have a certain like strain of tomato or whatever that makes its own uh, pesticide. I don't know if that's true of tomatoes specifically, but um, some plants like have built in pesticides in their leaves um, so that they don't get eaten. Um, I think milkweed is typically one of those, but butterflies love eating it. So we've answered what kind of experiments you've done, looking at what are looking at, hey, you're back in a building. I'm back in the building. I'm, I'm hopping out of my computer right now. So Great. hopefully have a little more uh, All right, stable. so you, you last said uh, you, you're one of the things you're trying to figure out is how to stop insects from eating bugs and that's where it cut off. Yes, so there's a lot of ways that you can do that. So one of the first things that I worked on um, was, uh, uh, in a pesticide lab. So we were just trying out different pesticides to see what worked best, because honestly, the best way to 
prevent bugs from eating plants is to kill them. Right. Um, <laughs> um, so that, uh, so we were just trying out different pe types of pesticides um, and some of them work better than others. Um, and some of them work better for specific kinds of bugs uh, than they do other kinds of bugs. Um, so that's uh, a lot of our um, questions. And then my, my master's thesis was actually looking at how we can hide crops from bugs using uh, different kinds of uh, plants that grow alongside them. Oh. Uh, let me switch over now. Okay. Um, did you see me log in? I feel like I'm logged in. Oh, let me find you. Give me additional permissions. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so, so we were looking at, at hiding crops from plants with uh, cover crops. So cover crops are a type of um, uh, additional crop that you plant either alongside a uh, cash crop or in a different time of the year. Right, we should be able to hear you from your computer right now. Oh, I need to make you a co-host. Sorry, Peter. All right. No, awesome. Awesome. No, I, it, was, it was a fun switch over. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we, we learned, I mean, at least in that specific instance of my master's thesis that we can hide, we were looking at eggplant, we can hide them by planting them into um, uh, basically cover crop residue. So growing uh, grasses and, and clovers through the winter um, and then planting the eggplant into those and kind of leaving those grasses and, and clovers intact, we can actually hide the eggplant from the pest that we were particularly interested in, which is Colorado potato beetle, which is a, a pest on eggplant. And um, the, but the important question that we had uh, to follow up with that was, is it economical? So even though we, we did see reductions in the pest population, which is great, we didn't see an overall increase in our production. So it was not economical. So it would not right. be a thing that we recommend to growers, which is always kind of how we couch these questions is what's what's going to be the, the bottom line answer for a farmer who's looking for a recommendation for how to control these things. So yeah, there's an infinite variety of ways that you can kind of deal with insects wanting to eat crop plants. Um, and a lot of the questions we answer are asking is, which of these different ways is best? Yeah. Uh, and so some of them are better than others. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. <laughs> our next question is from Charlene. How does organic compared to inorganic growth? Uh, that's a great question. So um, organic versus inorganic are legal definitions in the United States for how we classify uh, different methods of rearing crops. So there are organic fertilizers, which are approved for use in organic systems. Um, and there are organic pesticides that you can use in organic systems. In a conventional system, which is what we call non-organic uh, production, you can still use organic products, but you have the option to use non-organic products. Um, usually non-organic products are um, more refined tools. So um, a pesticide that has been you know, uh, modified to be more effective or to be safer, um, or a fertilizer that has been concentrated, or you can buy a fertilizer with only one nutrient in it. You know, if, imagine if you, you know, it's basically the equivalent of eating vitamins instead of eating food, right? Right. Um, so production can be the same in both systems. It just means in organic systems, you're more limited as far as what tools you can use to produce stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're farming at a more difficult level but you can still get as much production in an organic system as a conventional system and vice versa. Um, and then the questions of, you know, sustainability and long-term farming and use of those tools, those, those kind of come up, but in the short term, they can be pretty comparable. It's just that organic is more difficult. Cool. Thanks. The next question is from Spencer. Do you perform any crosses with your crops? I, uh, we don't. So my boss is actually, that is his, background. His specialty is creating new varieties of crops and things like that. But we are currently not doing any of that research. Um, we 
are mostly focused on production. So we are involved in a large nationwide program right now that is looking at creating more disease resistant varieties of tomatoes. So they are taking uh, varieties of tomatoes that have already been established to be resistant to a couple of different types of diseases and then crossing them together and then raising up the seeds from those crosses and we're taking the seeds that they have produced, growing them out and giving them information on how those uh, fruits produce. So we actually, we had like 30 some last year and quite a few of them were nicely disease resistant. Um, but one of the things that we did was taste tests and they all tasted horrible. They, they, were, they were so bad. Like we, they ranged from like flavorless to like one of them tasted like rancid peanut butter and yeah it was just like a very weird range of you know and when you're tasting 30 different tomato slices it, it gets old really quick yeah i'm sure um, but uh actually the so from, from that they basically scrapped all of those varieties and they did more crosses and now we're starting over again to see if we can uh develop new varieties but yeah uh, we're involved in those projects but we're not currently doing any any crosses here very cool. We've got a question from Caden, grade six. Uh, Caden wants to know, do you sell the vegetables that you make? We have a hydroponic system in class. What would you recommend growing in a hydroponic system? So two questions wrapped into one. Excellent. Okay. One, and I would say that is our, our one of our most common questions. Everybody wants to know with what, what we do with uh, what we produce. So I think last year we produced something like 60 tons of vegetables Whoa. here at the research farm. Yeah, massive amounts of it. Um, a lot of those are winter greens and things like that. Actually, here in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is where I'm based, there's actually a really great organization that networks out food donations. So they come to our research farm, they pick up everything that we harvest that is worth keeping. And they take it and they distribute it to a variety of homeless shelters and refugee groups, refugee aid groups in the area. So we don't have to deal with any of that kind of logistics stuff. They take care of all of that for us. But yeah, it, um, the vast majority of it gets gets donated. Everything that's worth keeping gets donated um, to be used by people who need it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and oh, what and would then, you recommend yes. for a hydroponic system? Yeah, Hydroponic system. Okay, that's excellent. I think um, one of the things that's really fun to do in hydroponics is leafy greens, so things like, like lettuce, and then also things like herbs. Like I'm very pro basil in a hydroponic system. I think basil oh. is really fun to grow. Um, and then that's something that like everybody can try a little piece of, which is great, you know, rather than like if you, you know, you have a hydroponic system, you grow a tomato, then, you know, you'd have to slice it up really tiny for everybody to get to try it. So I think basil is a, a fun one to do in a classroom setting or, or any kind of other herbs or leafy greens. So I'm pretty cool. into. Thanks. Yeah. Zach and James want to know if uh, you've seen the invasive spotted lanternfly. We have them now in Rhode Island. Have they been a problem? We have them in Philadelphia big time. Yeah, you guys, yeah, Philadelphia is right near the, uh, the, the original introduction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so right as I was getting ready to leave uh, my previous position, which was in Maryland, we had them move over into Maryland. And just last year, I believe we had them show up in North Carolina, but they are not here on our research farm yet. So they have been found in North Carolina, but not here yet. So we, we don't, haven't had to deal with them yet. We shall uh, see. It sounds like they're going further like north faster than they're going south. I don't know why. Yeah, I feel like they're, so my, my friends who work on spotted lanternflies tell me that they're really, really bad at flying and walking. So a lot of their movement is because they lay their eggs on trucks and things mm -hmm. like that. And then the truck will, you know, the eggs look like a slab of, you know, mud. Yeah. And so the truck will drive somewhere and then they'll hatch out and then we'll have a new introduction. So, and you'll see that like with, uh, with spotted lanternfly, they had them in Virginia, so they were inter introduced into Pennsylvania and then they had them in Virginia before they were in Maryland. So they didn't like spread. Right. Like, you know, they got you know, taken. They like hopped over because, you know, and with, where they were first found in Virginia was at a truck stop, you know, so somebody, you know, drove a truck and there you go. introduced them. So, yeah. So I think like the, their movement northward is going to, it's just people drive. Uh, there's a lot of people who live up in the Northeast compared to the Southeast. So I feel like that's right. just going to keep shuttling. That makes sense. There. Yeah. Um, Bluey Williams is class wants to know, is there a best soil for plants? No. <laughs> because of That's the plant, a, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, it absolutely depends on the plant. Yeah. So generally, um, yeah, there are a kind of, you want a loamy soil kind of is best practice. 
Yeah, um, or sandy oh. loamy, sandy loam soil. Um, you definitely don't want a solid straight clay soil. But yeah, there are different crops that grow better in different types of soil, which is why uh, it's one of the reasons why you know different states and different parts of the country grow different crops because they have different types of soil. Um, and some crops can handle um, stressful part, you know, parts of soil that might stress out cro uh, other crops. So blueberries, for instance, really like acidic soils. So they grow great in like the New Jersey Pine Barren area. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, carrots can handle a lot of salinity. They can handle a lot of salt in their soil. So they can be grown in areas uh, in Texas that um, can't grow other crops and like that. So yeah, there, uh, there are different types of crops prefer different types of soil and different combinations of nutrients and things like that. And then, and uh, to follow up on the previous question, uh, a lot, there are some crops that do better in hydroponic systems than others. Um, you know, so there, that's just because the, you know, the hydroponics are replacing the nutrients. And so, yeah, however, the, the plant interacts with its nutrient absorption through the roots is going to affect uh, how it can grow and where. Sounds good. All right, we got a question from Mr. Bits's classroom. Uh, what chemicals do you use the most? I would say, well, what chemicals we use the most? Uh, I can say that very unequivocally, we use nitrogen the most, nitrogens and uh, in fertilizers. So mm -hmm. nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the three primary nutrients that plants need to live. Um, and nitrogen is absolutely the primary one. So whenever we plant plants, we go out there and we put on pounds and pounds of nitrogen um, because the plants need it to survive. And then when we use pesticides, we are trying to use as many different ones as we can. So if you use the same one over and over again, then the insect pests have the ability to evolve resistance to those, right? After many, many generations of being exposed to the same thing, they might you know, come up with a mutation that'll allow them to, to survive uh, that. So we always try and use as many different ones as we can. So we don't you know, use one over and over and over again or anything like that. But yeah, fertilizer is a chemical, all or it contains chemicals and we, we use that overwhelmingly the most in, in any situation. And even in our, our, our organic systems, we're applying fertilizers, we're applying things like chicken manure, you know, processed chicken manure um, or uh, poultry litter that contains nitrogen compounds, which are chemicals. Right, cool. All right, thanks. Next Great. question is from Aubrey, grade six. Um, what vegetables do you grow? How many types do you grow at once? And do you rotate them? Yes. That's a great question. Okay, how many, uh, that depends. Um, we, we grow, I don't even have a number off the top of my head. I bet we grew 20 different types of vegetables this summer um, and we're doing them in a lot of different experiments. So each experiment might have different numbers. So um, we did five different types of tomatoes, two different types of peppers, two different types of eggplant, two different types of loofah, two different types of cucumbers, three different types of watermelon, one species of bitter melon, um, two different types of cantaloupe. Um, yeah, that was, what, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> yeah, we grow a lot of different stuff and a lot of different uh, varieties. And usually we're, we're not comparing the varieties to each other. We're looking at like, okay, so we're growing these things in this type of high tunnel versus this type of high tunnel. And we wanna make sure that we're growing multiple varieties of a single crop to make sure that like the one that we happen to pick isn't an oddball. And a lot of it's really just more to confirm that like this is true for multiple varieties of peppers or whatever. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Sounds good. Um, do you have a favorite? Uh, was there another part of the, uh, do you rotate? Oh the yes, we absolutely do. Yeah, a lot of my um, kind of planning right at this moment, right, we're kind of transitioning into fall crops is where we're going to put crops so that they are not where they were last time. So because we're growing the same crops many multiple years, we rotate them by shifting where we plant them. So, um, you know, we can't not grow tomatoes one summer because tomatoes are one of our big research projects, right. but we can change where we grow them so that we're not running into issues with building up pest populations or disease populations in that area, which is the primary reason that people rotate crops. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we absolutely do that. Good practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question is what type, when you like gather your information, you get your answers. What type of farmers do you get that information to? 
That's a great question. So because I work for an 1890 university, our target demographic for farmers is socially disadvantaged farmers, historically small farms and historically black or people of color farms. Um, but our information is available to everyone. So uh, we publish our uh, information online. We have free handouts and publications with all of the information that we have in it. So it's available to anyone who wants it. Um, we are a public resource, but our, when we are we we're designing our research questions, it is always with the demographic in mind of helping small farmers in our area who have historically been disadvantaged. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Next question is from Joshua. What vegetables do you grow in the winter? Mm, that's a great question. Okay. Again, one that I've been thinking about a lot. So the one that we're planting, uh, that I'm the most excited about this winter is we're doing a big garlic trial. So garlic is planted in the fall and then it lives throughout the winter and then it grows a whole bunch in the spring and then you harvest it in like the early summer. So we'll be maintaining a garlic field throughout the fall. Um, as far as our more active pr production, we just this week planted broccoli, cabbage and cauliflower, which we will grow for the next month and a half to two months. We'll be harvesting it late November probably um maybe maybe early mid-november um and then we're in the greenhouse or in the high tunnels we're going to be planting carrots which are a long growing cool season crop we'll also be growing bok choy which is um kind of like a cabbage uh for those of you who don't know it and then we'll be growing a lot of lettuce so those are our three and that we're focusing on and we're growing 12 different varieties of each of those um we are looking to be able to those are traditional crops that are grown in the winter, they're high value crops. People can grow, make a lot of money selling lettuce, especially things, local lettuce. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that people grow in the winter to make a little bit of money in, in the off season, what is traditionally the off season. Um, and it's a good way to make use of a high tunnel in the winter. Um, and so we wanna be able to make recommendations of what varieties produce well in our area. So that's what, that's what we're doing. We're just growing a whole bunch of different varieties to see what grows well. So we can tell people, oh, this one was, this was good. Really Go good, awesome, sounds <laughs> yeah. good. Um, do deer ever eat your plants? That's a great question. Yes. So we do have problems with deer here. I actually saw three bucks this morning out in one of our soybean fields. One of them was a nice six. Got me excited about deer season. Um, but yeah, we, we put up electric fencing to keep deer out of our high tunnels and our experimental plots. Um, we have we have fencing around most of our farms, but but yeah, we do have to do additional electrical fencing uh, to keep them out. Yeah, deer are a big pest uh, animals. And we actually have uh, quite a few large irrigation ponds um, that we use to pump water out of to irrigate our crops. And so they all uh, have attracted huge populations of Canada geese. So we do also have a lot of geese problems with uh, our crops. So yeah, trying to trying to keep things from eating our crops is part of our part of my job. Challenge. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It's delicious successful. to us. It's delicious to other animals too. Yes. yes exactly. uh, well, um, all right. We got a question from Sahil. Are bugs really useful in some places and in what ways? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Yes, absolutely. Bugs are useful. So um, the biggest um, I think most well-known way that bugs are useful is pollination. So a lot of our crops need to be pollinated. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you think about uh, vegetable crops in particular, you're thinking about fruits, right? You're thinking about uh, pumpkins or eggplant. The fruit can only be produced uh, most of the time with pollination. So the plants have to have pollen transferred from the male parts of a plant to the female parts of a plant. Uh, so that they can grow a fruit because the fruit is really just a vessel for the seeds, which are baby plants. So that has to happen and pollinators do that. So we have a whole bunch of different pollinators um, in the United States, um, hundreds of native species of bees and flies and wasps and beetles that are doing all of that work for us. Um, so all of that is going on. And one of the things that we do when we focus on sustainable pest management for insect pests is we try, and avoid, we try and make sure that anything that we do to kill pests is not gonna kill those beneficial insects. So a big, big one is um, a lot of pesticide labels now are required to have information about pollinators on them. So, you know, if, if 
the pesticide that you're buying has the potential to hurt bees, it'll have a label or it'll have a warning on it saying you can't spray this once the, the crop has started to flower or right. you can only spray it in the late evening when there aren't pollen pollinators really, really like being out there in the early morning, early to mid mornings when it's sunny um, and the flowers are open, but it, you can kind of spray in the, in the evening if your pesticide doesn't have a long res residue and stuff like that, but you could still get your pests that way. Huh. Um, and then in addition to pollinators, the other big group of beneficial insects is uh, predators and parasitoids. So a lot of our control of our insect pests is just given to us for free by mother nature in the form of other insects. So coming in and eating stuff like that. So um, especially in our organic tunnels, um, one of our big pests is aphids. Um, and uh, I, my, my current strategy with aphids is don't do anything about them. So they, they come in, they get really, really bad. The plants look really terrible. Um, and then about a week or two later, we get uh, ladybugs showing up. We get surfed fly larvae showing up. We get lace wings showing up and they just clean them out. And then we don't really have an issue with them for the rest of the year. And those predators will just keep that population down. Um, so that's one of the things that we work on. We're, we're, you know, we're trying not to spray pesticides that would hurt those predators. Um, and uh, they'll take care of that for us. And then in tomatoes, we have uh, quite a few caterpillar pests that are really bad. Um, and a lot of those are taken care of by parasitoid wasps. So wasps will come and stab their uh, eggs into the caterpillar and the eggs will hatch out and you know eat the caterpillar from the inside out, um, which is horrible for the caterpillar, but it's great for us who don't want caterpillars eating our tomato leaves. So yeah, lots of great bugs out there. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, we've got a question here. How do you protect your crops when there are heavy rains? Oh, heavy rains. Well, okay. So one of the really big advantages of the high tunnel is that we have a protected culture system. So we're growing underneath plastic and the mm -hmm. plastic traps heat, but it also keeps the rain out. So it's a, that's a really, really big benefit to us and production in a high tunnel. Um, and uh, there's really nothing you can do for crops that are outside of a high tunnel. It's, it's almost Hope for the best to go out there and yeah cover them up we had um we had a really bad hail storm early this summer that wiped out two experiments that weren't inside of high tunnels um of course there is there are drawbacks to growing under plastic too is when you get a nice good rain you don't get that water in the high tunnel either so we have to do manual irrigation for all of our production um so everything is on drip irrigation and so every time we want water to go to our plants we have to go out there and run a pump um, and, you know, pump the water to the plants. So we can't just rely on mother nature for that. So that's kind of the trade-off that we get. But in addition, um, you know, heavy rains are, are bad. Um, also rain is one of the big ways that plant diseases spread. So, um, as the water droplets, you know, fall through the air, they'll hit a spore for a plant disease and knock it down, or the droplet hits the ground and splashes the, the mud up onto the leaves and the mud will have, um, you know, disease spores in it. Um, so that's how plant diseases, a really common way that plant diseases spread. Um, so by preventing rain from falling onto the leaves and only watering the plants right at the roots, we get a lot more control over that. So we have a lot less disease issues inside the high tunnels than we do outside the high tunnels. So they, they really pay off in a lot of, a lot of different ways. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, let's see. So of all of the things that you have learned, uh, what is the most surprising result that you've had? The most surprising result that I've had. Oh, uh, hmm. Uh, man, am I going to be able to come up with an answer to that one? I don't know. Uh, I'm. I know I have been surprised by results. I literally cannot think of anything off the top of my head right now. That's Sorry. fine. But I. I actually. That. That's. This is a question that we get a lot. Mm -hmm. Um. And I never know what I'm surprised by like I can I can a lot of times in in science you're like trying to get an experiment to work but I'm not usually I, like I'm like it'll either do this or, or, or it'll do this mm -hmm. um, and it's rare for it to spontaneously do this it's usually the things that surprise me a lot of the time are mm -hmm. things that I was never even looking for in the first place like mm -hmm. things that I will encounter when like raising my squid so I'm a squid biologist uh back background uh for folks at home um or like I'll be out collecting squid and I'll be like, what? 
this lives here. I didn't think this was supposed to live here. You know, like that's the kind of like moments of, oh my God, that I get are usually not when I'm doing the experiment. It's usually when I'm like going through life, uh, experiencing wildlife. That's when I usually get the like, oh my gods. Um, I don't know about you. Yeah, I mean, I feel like those, but I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do experience those kinds of things. Um, as far as, uh, yeah, I'm always, I'm always excited by new crops. I think that that's one of the things that always surprises me is kind of how much I like. For instance, this summer was the first time I ever grew uh, loofah and bitter melon, and I've been so excited by. Um, one, how well they do. So they grow amazingly well. They have no disease issues. They have no pest issues that I can see, at least here. We haven't had any at all. Um, they produce like gangbusters and the bees love them. Like they've been a beneficial, so they have not, so whenever you grow a new crop, it's kind of like, what am I going to get? And we haven't had any issues with um, you know, a lot of times, you know, they'll attract aphids and then the aphids will spread over into the peppers and you're like, oh, dang, this, this is unfortunate, but this has yeah. been like, they've attracted so many pollinators. They just bloom constantly forever. Um, and, uh, you know, big, beautiful flowers. Um, and they've just been a, a joy to grow. And so I, I got really excited about that this summer. Um, cool. yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. We are almost at the end here. I'm going to ask one more audience question and then we're going to ask our two, like, always ask questions. Um, okay. So we've got a seventh grade class cl classroom that wants to know what motivates you at work? Like what gets you going when you're working? Oh yeah, this is a great question. Um, I, I mean, I love my work. I love learning new stuff. Um, and also I love the fact that um, there's always something that like has to be done. So even on mornings where I'm like, oh, I don't really want to like go do stuff or whatever. It's like, well, too bad. It has to be done. like, yeah. there's a plant out there that will die if I don't show up. I cannot put off any of my work, mm -hmm. um, except in the like fall winter when it's all just like typing numbers into Excel. I can put that off. That's hard yeah. to motivate. But yeah, I, I love, I love having like things that have to happen immediately. Um, and then I'm always, I mean, there's always some question that needs to be answered or problem that needs to be solved. And I really love solving problems. So mm. that is kind of one of those things that I guess is really weird about me is like when it's like, oh no, this is broken or this is, we have this issue with where, oh no, we have this disease that we've noticed. It's like, all right, well, time to like figure out how to solve that problem. And that's the kind of thing that, that gets me going in the morning. Awesome. Sounds good. That's a good <laughs> answer. Um, okay. So we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end of each session. The first question is if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would it be? Um, it would be that uh, farming is a business. Um, and as such, it's beholden to all the same like economic pressures that influence any kind of business in, in our society. So, um, a lot of the issues that people have around farms that they, that they think and that they're aware of around farms, you know, the death of the small farm and non-sustainable farming practices and things like that. Those, a lot of those come down to the realities of people have to make money or they want to make money. Right. And so if people want to solve those issues, we have to restructure how we think about food production. And it has to, it has to, fundamentally change away from a profit-driven model, um, right. which is a big, big ask. Right. That's like a whole, uh, like morals code situation. Like, uh, yeah, that's, that sounds hard. Um, yeah. But yes, that sounds good. That's a good thing to, to talk to people about. The next question, you still have everybody's attention in the world. You can tell them one thing, but it can be about anything, whatever you want. What do you tell them? Um. Uh, yeah, outside of my area of specialization, I mean, at least climate change, we oh, need yeah. to do something about climate change. I mean, and it, and it ties back to farming that like we can only modify our farming methods so much to, to account for that. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's the most important thing that we need to be working on right now is, is dealing with and mitigating climate change. Yep. It's the thing that affects all things. Yes, deal absolutely. With it. Absolutely. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was really cool and fun. Um, even when you were dropping out, we were learning a lot yeah, of cool stuff. That. So that was great. Uh, I hope, thank you everyone at home for um, for like sticking with us through all of that. Um, next week, Monday, we're going to be talking about bats 
and paleontology. So we've got um, a scientist who studies like the evolutionary history of bats. Um, it's going to be so cool because bats, so weird. They fly, but they're mammals. Like, let's learn about that. It's going to be cool. So join us all at 1 p.m. on Monday um, for bats and paleontology. Um, is there anything else you want to plug before we wrap up? Um, yeah. Follow Peter on Instagram for cool bug pics. Follow me on Follow Instagram for cool bug pics. Bug pics. Um, follow uh, Nature Check on Twitch if you want to watch me play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Great. Okay. And what's your handle on Instagram again? Uh, at uh, Peter L. Coffee. Peter letter, L. Coffee. L. Yeah. Some other dude already stole Peter. There's Coffey. another Peter Coffee out there, apparently. All right. Uh, sounds good. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.